Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to our first uh, capacity development webinar today, hosting Kevin O'Brien on a Fairbase tool for improving global data sharing. Um, thank you all for attending. There's still a couple people coming in, but I'm going to get started so we have enough time for a discussion at the end. Um, just as a heads up, you've entered in listen only mode and the meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the Goose website. Next slide, please. I want to just quickly give a very, very broad introduction to the uh, observing coordinating group and the capacity development team so you all know what we're doing. The observing coordinating group is part of the Global Ocean Observing System and works to operate, maintain, and coordinate an efficient and integrated comprehensive in situ global observing system. Next slide, please. And as part of that, we have different teams and one of them is the capacity development group. And our vision is to create a global network of observing systems with integrated regional needs through shaping capacity, knowledge, technology, and skills. And our mission is to identify and support regional ocean observing development and integration into the global ocean observing system in a way which encourages cross-network activities and resource sharing. And we've been working on writing a two-year plan and part of that plan is to host a webinar series, which today is the first one. Next slide, please. And today's webinar is on fair-based, uh, sorry, fair-based tool for improving data sharing. And we're currently planning two more, one on the Ocean Ops tool and one on Ocean Best Practices. Um, please keep an eye on the Goose website and you'll be notified there when we have a specific date for for the webinars. Um, again, just a reminder, uh, the, webin the webinar is recorded so you can access the webinar later on the Goose website and the link is on this uh, slide that you're seeing right now. If you have any questions after the talk, please put your questions in the chat box and I will, or in the question section of the box and I will read them out loud for Kevin to answer. Um, there will be a survey that will be sent out to all the participants today um, where we would like to ask you uh, to fill that out so we can get some feedback on how the webinar might be able to be improved, um, if at all. And we would like, highly encourage you to reach out either through the Goose um, email address that's on the bottom of this slide and also let's show the slide again later for anyone who needs um, to write it down. Um, to use either that or the survey to let us know if you have any topics that would uh, interest you that you would like us to potentially consider uh, in the future. Anyhow, to get started, um, I will quickly introduce today's speaker, Kevin O'Brien. Kevin is a senior research scientist at the University of uh, Washington and is a member of the Data Integration Group at NOAA Pacific Marine Environmental Lab in Seattle, Washington. As Vice Chair for Data and Information of the Goose Observations Coordinating Group, he has led the development of an open access to GTS project and is currently working on a data strategy for OCG and associated observing networks. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kevin. Thank you very much, Anne. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be here today, uh, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, to talk to you a little bit about ERDEP and how we can hopefully use it to help improve global data sharing. I would like to thank the uh, Goose webinar committee and the OCG Cap capacity development team for having me today. So we have lots to cover, so I'm just going to jump right in. So today I want to talk about, um, as I said, I want to give an introduction to the observations coordination group a little bit, which Anne has already done, so I don't have to do too much more. Provide some insight into why we're going about a creation of a data strategy. But the meat of the, the webinar is really going to be talking about ERDAP and some of the data management challenges that we can hopefully solve using ERDAP as a tool to do that. I want to provide a few demonstrations of using ERDAP and then we'll just kind of close out with a kind of summary of the benefits that we get from using ERDAP. So Anne uh, did a great job in just introducing the observations coordination group and, and its role in coordinating activities amongst the global networks. I won't uh, go much further into that, but just mention that we do have a few vice chairs uh, for WMO connections to WMO. We have a vice chair for standards and best practices and vice chair for capacity development, which is the newest vice chair in the OCG. And so those are, are in addition to the data and information vice chair. 
So uh, within the observation coordination group, one of the responsibilities is also to uh, coordinate the data flows between the networks. And um, in order to do that better, we are trying to develop a data strategy which will improve integration and interoperability between the networks. And with this data strategy, we also want to ensure that the interoperability efforts we're making will go beyond just the ocean networks that we're, we're uh, responsible for coordinating, but also, um, you know, uh, touch some of the other communities within within the science world. And so the data strategy that we're looking at will be based on fair data principles, which are definable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, as this is a first good step to try improve interoperability. It's not the only thing that needs to be done, but it's a good, it's a good first step. And we'll be working very closely with uh, OceanOps um, on harmonization of metadata across the networks, but also with an eye to improving access and understanding of the data outside of the networks. Uh, we want to ensure that this data strategy is compatible with overlapping work being done in IODE, which is the International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange, in their development of this Ocean Info Hub, as well as the activities that are going on with WMO and the evolution of the WMO Information Service, or WIS, uh, WIS 2.0. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about the many data challenges that we all face in today's landscape because most of us are well aware of them. There were, uh, was a paper uh, put together for the Takeda Ocean Ops 2019 meeting, uh, Ocean Fair Data Services by Tenawa et al., which delves into some of these challenges that we all face, including the diversity of data or missing or lack of metadata. Uh, the increased volume and variety of data is, is really an issue that uh, challenges uh, us moving forward. Uh, lack of common protocols, different data formats, all of these challenges kind of add up to ultimately mean that data access and use can be difficult and is difficult for users that are not domain experts. And so embracing the FAIR principles is the first step towards improving that. So when we think of some data data challenges that we have, we think of our typical user. This is a, this is a Python user. You know, it could be for more experienced people. It could be a MATLAB user, but it's a user who wants to access to some temperature data. And, and immediately, you know, this is one place that has temperature data, but they are immediately faced with some challenges when we look at the formats of the data that exist. There are ASCII files. There's NetCDA files. There's a database. There's three different storage mechanisms mechanisms for these files. On top of that, there's different ways to actually, different services that are providing those files. One is, in this case, is an FTP server, but imagine the database is hooked to a web front end that needs a username and a password to get to. So as the user tries to access that data, they have to make two or three, maybe more different requests to get that data. And so this is immediately posing some challenges to a user that wants to use this data. The data is in different formats, so they will probably likely have to do some reformatting in order to use it in the Python module of their choice. Uh, some of the files may have lots and some of the data sets may have lots and lots of files. Imagine the drifting buoy data, which has 15, 16, 1800 drifters each at an individual file. That's a challenge in and of itself. Uh, the formats are different. There's ASCII, there's NetCDF, there's a database. Um, this is an issue because now that the user has to do some reformatting. And these services aren't really amenable very to very complex or, or efficient web services for scripting access to the data. Uh, in addition, we don't really know. Maybe the metadata isn't complete. Maybe there are some issues to, to drive that. So the, the bottom line is that downloading understanding and using data shouldn't have to be a software development project, but all too often it is, and, and scientists and people waste time doing data software for reformatting when they should be just working with the data. Now, from the data provider side, you know, they want to improve their services so that those data challenges that we just talked about uh, are, are not affecting their users. However, this is not a very easy thing to do because, as we pointed out, users want data in many formats depending on what their clients are. And data providers don't want to have to provide the data in all those formats because then you're duplicating data and then you have data versioning issues, which just become a nightmare. Uh, machine, -to -machine, machine services are becoming more and more important as we have more and more volumes of data and metadata to, to harness and to um, process through. So uh, those, those services need to be robust. Um, large aggregating large collections of say the drifter data can be difficult if a user wants to look at the whole collection at once rather than individual granules again do you have to duplicate the data to make a, a giant data set with everything uh, we don't want to have to do that 
Uh, what about if you realize that the 5,000 files that you created 10 years ago aren't quite up to the standards when it comes to metadata? Maybe they don't quite meet the CF conventions uh, compliance. And so, oh my gosh, having to rewrite those can be a huge hassle. And then discovery, of course, we need to be able to find thing. We need to be able to find the data holdings and how do you best support discovery mechanisms? And so you have to do all this stuff as a data provider while thinking about fair principles and supporting new technologies like schema.org and linked data. These can be overwhelming. And so this is where ERDAP comes in to try and help solve some of these problems. So, so what is ERDAP? For those that are familiar, I, this will be a, a review, but for those who are just learning about ERDAP for the first time, uh, basically, ERDAP is a data broker which is designed to help people who are providing data make it easier to share that data and metadata to humans and machines in many different formats. And for data users, it's it, it's, a, it's a data broker that allows you to get to the data that you want using your favorite client without having to reformat that data. So that's a very key piece for users. So a little bit more background on ERDAP. It's open source. It's uh, soft. It's open source. It's freely available. It was developed at NOAA's uh, Southwest Fisheries. The lead developer of ERDAP is Bob Simons from the Environmental Research Division group. There. Um, it's as I said. It's open door, open source. It's available for download. It's available in Git for public modifications and enhancements. Uh, in fact, over the last couple versions, several enhancements have been added by uh, users in the ERDAP community. Um, and, and because of its capabilities and its open source nature, uh, ERDAP deployments, they've been rising over the past several years and there's now a robust user and support community and a growing development community. And in fact, ERDAP has been installed at over 85 organizations, which include NOAA, eModNet, the Marine Institute of Ireland, Ocean Observatory Initiative, and, at least, and, in, and in at least 15 different countries. So <clears throat> it's low cost, it's relatively low technological requirements, make it an ideal uh, tool for potentially improving and developing data access and sharing capabilities. So if we go back to our data user who's looking to access temperature data and we throw ERDAP into the equation, how does that change things? So if we wrap this data around ERDAP, it changes things massively because now what happens is that the, the MATLAB user, well, this is the MATLAB user, our experienced MATLAB user, is looking to access this data but only has to use one uniform way to access all of this data. So it, the user is now abstracted from whatever storage mechanism is, is storing the data, whether it's a database or it's net CDF files. All they know is they're making a request to an ERDAP service and they're receiving that data in the format that they selected, whether it's a CSV, whether it's a net CDF, whether it's JSON, it's the format that they want. There's no reformatting they can do. And the, the services that ERDAP provides in terms of the web services and the API allow a user to set up much more complex scripting access and machine machine services, which I'll show you a little bit more about later. Also within ERDAP, you can fix metadata. So if there is uh, some metadata issues that are preventing compliance, you can fix the metadata through this configuration of the data set in ERDAP so that the user seeing the data sees the fixed metadata with the compliant metadata, but you haven't had to rewrite all your files. So that's a very big advantage for data providers. So that's good for the user, but what about the data provider? Does it really put a burden on the data provider? And, and, the, and it really doesn't. And the reason is this is the way the ERDAP server works. So you have a favorite client software, whether it's Python or MATLAB, what have you. It makes a request to the ERDAP service. Now that ERDAP service then translates that request into whatever the native storage um, facility is for that data. If it's a database or NetCDF or CSV files, translate that request to the native format, which then and that service then returns the data back to ERDAP, which will then translate that result into the format that the, that the um, user requested. So there's no need for the data providers to mess with formats. There's no need for the users to mess with formats but the users can get with the data in whatever formats they want. And in essence, the data provider is then also serving their data out in all these formats. So I hope that I've already started to sort of whet your appetite on some of the benefits that we can see using ERDAP and why it's useful for both data producers and data users to work with ERDAP services. Just to kind of recap, you know, for users, it just simplifies everything because they're able to make a sort of a uniform request that they understand to this API or through you know, human, human interaction with the web, web or that web page and specify a, a response file format that they want to use with the clients that they're familiar with. So there's no reformatting, they're just using the data. 
Now for the data providers, it really provides lots of, uh, lots of benefits because, because ZerdEp can broker data in so many different formats, it's really an ideal solution for existing and, and new obviously, but also existing data collections because ZerdEp can be dropped right in and configured to work with this existing data in their native formats. So if you're looking, if you're a data provider and you're looking to increase fair compliance and you're struggling with that, uh, ERDAP can be a way to help you get there. And it's also important to note that in terms of installing ERDAP, it's very straightforward to install. There's a very low technical barrier. It's, it's a Java application and it has uh, what they call a servlet container, which is like Apache Tomcat. Both of these are available, again, open source, freely available and well supported. So the, the, the barrier to actually getting an ERDAP service up and running is actually relatively low. Um, so let's see, the other thing is it can standardize the format of time data, which seems like a minor thing, but when you're using data within a, a application, that time, um, time specifications are, can be very difficult and, and, and strange among different data sets and different formats. Um, again, if you have collections of data, like the Drifter collection that you want to provide access to, access to as a collection, or as individual granules, you can provide either one of those um, either one of those uh, methods without having to duplicate the data. It's just very easy to set up. It's just a configuration. Uh, and really important is the the metadata um, harvesting that is available through ERDAP services. ERDAP will generate ISO 19115 uh, compliant documents on the fly, uh, so that the, um, they can be harvested for inclusion into other data discovery systems. It also supports schema.org um, structures right out of the fly. So this is important because schema.org is an effort to provide structured uh, data and metadata on the web. And it was developed by companies like Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo. And Google is pretty good at doing search. And so I think you know having a tool that supports the way Google wants to search scientific data is really important. And that is available just through installing your data in ERDAP. Okay, so we went through a lot. That was quite a lot of information, and um, I hope it uh, hope it made sense. Uh, we'll have time for some questions afterwards, of course. But now I wanted to kind of move into a little bit of a demonstration of actually using ERDAP to configure and access data. So what we're doing, what we have here is we have a, a tide gauge data set that has sea level in it. Uh, this is uh, from a tide gauge off of Easter Island, and this data set happens to be in a, a CSV file. So you can see the uh, snapshot of that file there in my uh, Excel um, application. So how do we get this data into ERDAP? We wanna get this data and use it within ERDAP. So I'm gonna go through a few um, configurations. I'm gonna run some um, some animations that I, the movies that I created actually configuring this. And I did this because I can't type and talk and think at the same time. So we'll try to run through these movies and give you a sense of what it is to actually work with data. So the first thing to know is that when you want to install a data set into ERDAP, there is a helper tool with ERDAP called generatedatasets.xml or generatedatasets.xml, sorry. Uh, so I, I will warn you that we will be looking at some XML, but don't freak out, you know, it's just XML, it's just uh, ASCII text with some closing and opening tabs and, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. So let's let's start running this uh, this tool. So we, we started generatedatasets.xml and what it shows you here is a whole, list of different data types that you can ingest into the ERDAP service. So for us today, we're looking at CSV files, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll choose the ASCII file option to read into ERDAP. So we paste that into the, the page there to tell it what type we're looking at. We just provide it the user directory, the, the, the directory where the data set exists, as well as the um, suffix of the data. So this is CSV data, so I wanna give it, have it look for the CSV files. There's lots of information uh, also that we can put in. We want to put the column where the column names are and then where the data start, starts and then what the, the separator is. Now, there's a lot of other information that will can be used for more advanced usages and configurations of data sets in the ERDAP, which I won't don't have time to get into today. But you can also add metadata in like URL for your, your institution, your institution name. Uh, I'm going to add a summary of C-level data so we can see it better in the ERDAP service later. Uh, and to note that all this information can be changed after the fact uh, once we create the file. And so now you see we've gone through all that and ERDAP has spit out some configuration XML that describes the data set that we pointed to, the C-level data sets in Easter Island. So that's the first step. We have created our first ERDAP configuration file. 
So the next thing we want to do now that we have that is we want to load this data in the Rear app. So how do we how do we do this? Okay, so here's the I'm using my favorite editor, uh, Emacs. <laughs> so where we have Emacs, we take that information that we just got from the generate data sets uh, program and we when we put it into the datasets.xml file, which is the data set file that that drives the ERDAP configuration. And we just simply change it to the reasonable name of C-level data and we save it. And that's it, we're done. We have configured this data into ERDAP. Let's go back to the, let's go have a look at the ERDAP server. You can see there's no data in this. Oh, uh, and hit reload the page and boom, there's our C-level data. So we have, actually now we have our data set in ERDAP. Let's go take a look at it. We can see the various parameters we had in there, C-level time, lat long, station name, and the, and the gloss ID. You can scroll down and get more detailed information about the about the data set. But if we hit submit, we just look at this HTML table of the data and we say, okay, our data is now in, in ERDAP. So this is great. So we've been able to, oops, sorry. Now, what, what you see in ERDAP as well is when, when I looked at the, the output formats, this list of formats here, all of the output formats that are available for you to use within ERDAP. So there's a long list there. So great, we're making some really good progress here. We installed our data, we configured the data, we loaded it into ERDAP data set. Now, I mentioned you can use ERDAP to help enhance or fix data set metadata. So how do we do that? Let's take a look at that. So this is our data set file again in ERDAP and we wanna have a look and if we go up to the C-level variable there, we can see that um, there's not a whole lot of metadata associated with it. There's only a long name attribute and an actual range. So we want to improve that because that's not CF compliant. So how do we do that? Do we need to reconfigure the data set, write something into the data set? We don't have to. We can just go to the data set configuration that already exists and add a few attributes uh, to that data variable that we want to improve the metadata for. So in this case, it's the standard or the C-level. And what we want to do is we want to kind of make this more CF compliant. So we're adding a standard name uh, attribute, uh, which is uh, C surface height in this case. And we will also add a units attribute to allow people to know what units are being, uh, are units that that variable was measured in. And so in this case, the units are millimeters. Uh, and so we'll add those in to, to the configuration. And then, then that's it. We don't have to go back and redo the configuration. We don't have to go back and change the, uh, the, the source data files. We have completed this. So when we save this and we go back to the ERDAP service and we reload it, we see that the um, metadata has been updated as we had hoped. So we'll reload the data set here. And yes, we can see under sea level, there's now a units of millimeters and a standard name as sea surface height. And so this is great. So we've fixed this metadata. And the important thing to note here is that now this data set has fixed metadata. So any other data we add to this data set, if we have other years, which I'll show you in a minute, it will also have the fixed metadata. So people coming in from outside to use this service to get the metadata will see the compliant metadata without having to recreate all of the files that went into this data set. So that's the next thing I wanna do is look at how do I update some of this data set data in ERDAP? I have more data I wanna add. In fact, I have, I have more years of data I wanna add in there. So how do I get that in there? I have five more years of data that go to 2017. So we can see the new data that I have. I wanna add those in there. If I add those in there, do I have to rerun configuration? Do I have to do anything else about the configuration? How do I, how does this happen? And so what I've done is I've moved the data into the directory and that's all you have to do. That's it. ERDAP is looking at this directory. And so when we go and hit uh, refresh the ERDAP page, we can see that the data now goes to 2017, which indicates that it has pulled in the new data simply by putting it in that directory. So this, this works great for adding other data sets too. So right now you can see there's only one data set. This is Easter, Easter Island tie gauge, but I have another tie gauge data set that I want to make part of this collection. And this is from a tie gauge called Rikatia. Uh, and it also has six years of data, as you can see there. So how do I include this? Do I have to rerun configuration? No, I don't. I just move this data into the same directory structure as the Easter Island data. They have separate, they have separate directories because we want to keep them separate, which is great. But in, in order to get this in ERDAP, all I have to do is go back to the original configuration, don't change anything, but I go up and I just change the, the um, directory that the ERDAP is looking at to grab the files. I move that up one, one level in the hierarchy, save the, save the 
um, configuration. And then when I reload the ERD app, you'll see, you can't tell the difference now, but when we look at the station name variable, you'll see that it, now it exists. And so now we can look at just the Rikatia data, we can look at just the Easter Island data, or we can look at them both in the same data set. We can do both. We can just just by changing that constraint. And so you see, we didn't do anything other than add this data to the hierarchy. It was very straightforward to add this data in. And again, the C level, the C level metadata is now is fixed for both of this data set. So now the Rikatia data, which also didn't have that that metadata information in it, now does. And so again, from the outside, the service has fixed the metadata without having to touch any of the original files. So that's a huge, huge saving burden for having to, if you have to fix a bunch of metadata. So that's great. So now within, I don't know how long that took us, 10 minutes or something, we were able to configure that data, load it into ERDAP, fix some metadata, and add, another, add more data and a different type gauge into the da same data set. So how do we access data from ERDAP? So I'm going to show you uh, how we're going to access data from our app. So this is again our our ERDAP page with our data set, and we see the C level information in the summary there. And this section here, which is FGD ISO metadata, what that means is this is your link to generating ISO compliant metadata. So if I hit that link that says I, what will happen is it will create a metadata. It'll create an ISO 19115 compatible document. And this is horrible. Nobody wants to look at this and, and no one would definitely want to create this. But the fact of the matter is that through these services, you can automatically create these, these metadata documents for your data. So you don't have to worry about that in the future. So if we go into the data set, what we want to do is we want to look at the whole time range of this data set. So we'll change the time widget to show the whole time range. And we're really only interested in C level over time. So we'll just grab those two variables. And um, we'll just look at Easter Island just to make it uh, simpler. Um, at this point, I think I'll, I'll select the CSV file because that's what I'm interested in uh, downloading. And so at this point, if I hit that submit button, what we would get is a CSV file <clears throat> with the, the full time series data for Easter Island. And we could take that and put it into Excel or whatever other tool we want to do. But I wanted to um, show you more about using the API uh, that is uh, with, oops, Oh, I did that. I did that in practice too. But I want to show you the API that's that's in the services. So if you see, whoops, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. If you see this generate the URL button, if you push that button, what will happen is a URL will be generated at that will provide the content that you wish to have. So it's a RESTful URL, and this is the connection into the ERDAP API. Everything you need to create the product you want it is contained in that URL. And so when we take that URL, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we can take that into some other program to actually access the data through machine services. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that URL and I'm going to go to something called the Jupyter Notebook. Now, this is just basically interactive Python in a browser. So this is Python code, but Jupyter Notebooks are a really good way to show using um, Python. So I'll just import a couple of the libraries that I need to make the plot. And you can see the URL that I copied from the um, ERDAP interface and put it in there. I'll, I'll set, that, um, set that URL up. And if we look at the URL, we can see it's relatively straightforward. We see that we're asking for sea level and time, and we're looking for the Easter Island station. And so you can see, begin to see with this RESTful URL where you can swap things out. So instead of Easter, if we had Rikatia in there, we would get the Rikatia data. So now that we set up that URL, we go ahead and pass that URL into Pandas to read the CSV from the ERDAP service and then make a plot. So this is very quickly done. And you can see there's our plot. So now within 12 minutes or so, we've we've set up ERDAP, we've put data in there, we fixed it, we added data, and now we're plotting it. And we can see there's something really interesting going on here in 2015 where the data sort of jump. And I don't know anything about this data, so I don't know why that happened, but this is something there's a very easy process to allow you to identify things like this. So this is why, great, we're already seeing so we're already seeing some benefits to using ERDAP. And again, I did it again, I'm sorry. One last thing that I wanted to show was that I wanted to put something in the ERDAP URL to make it a little bit more complicated. And so this is a server side operation where, you know, you can see that that time series plot up above, it's kind of dense and it's hard to tell anything but the extremes. And so let's decimate that data 
uh, and see how you know how it changes. And so you know a decimation process. If you download it all and you want to decimate, that could be very um, burdensome and time consuming. But because ERDAP has these particular um, server side operation that we can do this in a flash through ERDAP, which means that we're sending less data over the wire, which is very valuable for big data sets. Maybe not so much here, but so we're saying, give me, you know, every week, give me sort of the one tie gauge that's closest in time to that point. And so we 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 put that in the URL, and again, we just pass that URL to pandas to get the data and plot that data frame. And so you can see there that uh, that data has been decimated and it's you know it's much more readable so that's great so that sort of closes out the erdap demo we went from no no data set in erdap to actually using the data within 10 or 15 minutes which i think is pretty pretty amazing and that really showcases the power of the erdap api and really what you know when we use erdap what we're really trying to do is put nice interfaces on top of it to allow for interaction different types of interaction for users so they don't have to necessarily go to the user bird app interface and build the url and do that sort of thing we want to build tools on top of that so here's an example of a just a time series plot from um, an i use uh, hackathon that was done uh, back in october when we could all have more than two people in the room and they developed this time series javascript application that went to an bird app pulled the data set and plotted a time series this is an example from the Observing System Monitoring Center that tracks the real-time observations of all ocean platforms on the GTS. In this instance, you can pick a, a, a particular platform and get time series information from it. All of this is being driven by data ser uh, ERDAP services. And here's one from the Marine Institute in Ireland where they have a um, interactive tool to look at the buoy data around the uh, around Ireland and and interactively look at the temperatures and the various parameters and again this is all driven off of ERDAP services so the API is powerful enough to allow you to develop these really nice tools on top of the data services and this is on top of all the other things that ERDAP provides okay so we're winding here towards the end but I wanted to kind of summarize again some of the benefits that that we have with ERDAP so it's open source, it's available on GitHub, it's community supported. There are lower technical requirements. We're talking about configuring data sets, not writing code. And so that makes it much more amenable for lower technical requirements when you don't have to learn coding to interact with this service. And, and you can see that it acts as a pretty effective on the fly data format trans translator. So you can imagine communities that maybe should be working in CF, but don't quite know how to get there they could use ERDAP as a tool to help them make that leap. And so these first three points, to me, really strongly indicate how ERDAP can be useful in a capacity development uh, capacity to provide and improve data access and uh, data serving capacities for other developing nations. Um, the ERDAP services can be federated. So you can have 100 ERDAP services that are all pointed to by one mass, you know, one, one global ERDAP service. Uh, and that includes searching. So you, that means you could search through all those federated ERDAP services with one command. In fact, there's a, there's a website out there, erdap.com, that has been set up to do this with, I don't know, 50 or some ERDAP servers. Um, I showed you the server side functions. Um, one of the things that I, I don't have, didn't get to show you, but it, I'm really excited about is in, in the newest version of ERDAP, you can ingest data directly into ERDAP. So you can imagine, you know, a real-time sensor that is, is creating data rather than having to go into an intermediate file and then load up into an ERDAP, you can push that data directly into ERDAP so that the data is available through all of ERDAP's services and capabilities within seconds of being measured. That's that's really amazing. Um, and again, the ability to connect machine-to-machine -machine services will allow us to Har allow other entities like the IOD Ocean Info Hub that I mentioned to harvest the information that they need directly from these data services. And we've all been on calls where we, we've been asked to provide metadata, which, you know, maybe there's only 10, 10 things of metadata they've asked you to provide, but it's a hassle to do that. And so if this can be done through services that are harvesting, it's not ever a burden for people anymore. And that's, that's, really, that's really neat, I think. And there's so many more things that I didn't even get to talk about. Like there's a way to keep track of the status of data sets so you can see if it's out of date. There's a data provider form that you can ask people to help fill in to, to improve the metadata that exists in ERDAP data sets. And I've talked a lot about in situ data and that's the examples I use, but ERDAP is fantastic with rectilinear gridded data as well. Any, you know, any of the services that are available through ERDAP 
were great on the rectilinear rectilinear metadata, including you know pulling down data, uh, ISO 19115 data documents and schema.org and everything. So there's so many more uh, things in RDAP. And just to finish up, I just want to say that you know for those that are looking for ways to serve data interoperability, RDAP is a great choice. Um, for those that maybe already have some services. You know, perhaps you want to consider running ERDAP in addition to your other services. This is not an instead of, this is an addition to. You know, maybe ERDAP will provide something in addition to your existing services that, that you didn't have and you would have had to develop some code for, but you can instead use ERDAP to leverage those things. And lastly, it's sort of a, I don't know, it's kind of a running joke within the ERDAP user developer community where we say, gosh, you know, it'd be great if we could ask ERDAP to bin observations in a one by one degree lat long you know grids and that'd be great and then we find out oh yeah erdap already does that you know we so that's kind of the joke we say yeah erdap already does that you know and so when we're talking about providing fair data access erdap already does that and has been doing it for a long time and so this is my last slide um i wanted to just put up some erdap references i'm not going to go through all these and, and they'll be available in the slides but you can, you know, this is the home page for ERDAP, but there's also a curated list of different ERDAP projects and deployments that the, the guys at the Marine, uh, the Marine Institute in Ireland put together. There's a Python and R mechanisms for working with ERDAP servers. There's even Docker images, which I didn't even mention that, but if you want an easier way to even work with ERDAP, you know, Docker images that contain ERDAP exist that have been developed. And there's also uh, example configurations uh, that the US Integrated Ocean Observing System has put together for use within their regional associations, but that could be helpful for others. So thank you very much. And uh, Anne, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, again, a quick reminder, um, you are all muted. So if you raise your hands and you have a question, please click the little questions uh, button. There's a little um, drop down menu and post your question in there and I'll read it. And if we don't get to all the questions, we'll make sure to um, keep the questions log and uh, send it off to Kevin so he can follow up with you guys. Um, I wanna just go ahead and read a couple of the questions. Um, there's one that came in um, asking about, could you elaborate some more on how ERDAP improves data set uh, metadata? Okay, yeah, uh, definitely. I hope that I showed how that can happen within the configuration. I mean, basically within within every ERDAP and within every data set, there's a configuration that exists in the ERDAP datasets.xml file. And that configuration outlines um, metadata attributes for every parameter in the file, but also global metadata attributes. And so you can add attributes in the configuration file to uh, support whatever metadata you're looking to enhance. And once those are saved and the ERDAP server is updated, then those are just available for, through the services. Great, thank you. Um, uh, a little different question. Um, not to be negative, but are there any disadvantages to using ERDAP? Are there any disadvantages? Well, I mean, off the bat, I want to say no, but I mean, you know, it, 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 you do have to install it. You do have to have a, a decent internet connection in order to um, let people, you know, get access to the data. So um, those are the only things I can really think of. Otherwise, there, no, I, I can't think of a lot of this. Advantages to having heard up, particularly when we're thinking about, you know, in addition to and not instead of. So for example, I mentioned a gridded data, <clears throat> excuse me, it supports gridded data, but when we're talking about, um, you know, curvilinear grids or, or you know, those, these unstructured grids, it doesn't do a very good job with that. So you'd want to look at something like the Hyrax server or threads. Great, thanks. Um, there is a question on security. Uh, security. Um, if a government agency wants to be a data user, can the connection to ERDAP be made securely? Yes, yes it can. Uh, it can be made securely and also you can protect data sets with usernames and passwords. You know, we don't like to do that because we want open data, but of course there are cases where that is necessary. Uh, and yes, you can do that. And, I, and I'll mention that at ERDAP, within NOAA, ERDAP is one of the recommended data servers. And so it has gone through some security audits because of that. And, and so there is a level of um, understanding about that and checking to make sure there are no obvious 
uh, security gaps. Sometimes the security gaps come from things like, uh, you know, if there's an issue with the Tomcat server that has to get upgraded because an exploit was discovered. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question is, in addition to the Unix command prompt, do you have a more user-friendly GUI interface to load data into Erdup and edit the metadata? There is not. No, right now it's really that um, um, <clears throat> that that command line script that does that. Um, you know, and and that is used as a basis for creating a configuration file. Certainly, a more, as you become more experienced with using Erdup, you maybe ne don't necessarily need to use that, and you can use sort of templates from other examples. Uh, but having a, a, a graphical user interface would be something that would be great and something that seems like a really good idea for like a hackathon. Uh, enough people use this that it may be useful to, um, to, to do that. There have been, I'm aware of, some smaller attempts to develop graphical user interfaces for ERDAP based on very um, consistent data that's coming in. Uh, and that's quite simple to do because of the, the, um, the, the formats and the, the interop the XML format of the configuration file is quite easy to process and so it's very easy to create simplistic versions of that but as a general tool they're non-existent it would be difficult but it, it seems possible. Great um, the next question is on uh, combining data files. Um, at our data center we have thousands of files of the same data type for example CTD profiles. Is it advisable to aggregate tens of thousands of files into one data set. Yeah, that's a that's a good that's a great question. Um, there 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 probably are give and takes with the number of files versus larger files. Um, and and you know one of the things that's important to understand when aggregating uh, data sets within ERDAP is that you do lose some of the granularity of the metadata. And so um, if there are if there's metadata in the in an individual file that's unique to that profile, when you aggregate it with ERDAP, you, you will likely lose that. Um, but there are ways to to fix that. So within ERDAP, you can elevate metadata elements to variables, so that those variables that change within profiles are still available to users uh, to use. Um, so that's that's just one kind of not, didn't really answer the question. Uh, in terms of the number of files, you know, there may be I haven't run into an issue where number of files has been an issue. We have ERDAPs that support thousands of files, uh, you know, less than 10, between two and five or something that have not been an issue. But I would imagine at some point, you know, a computer scientist might be able to analyze it and have a point of return where larger files might be better, you know, fewer larger files might be better than more smaller files. But I don't know what that is yet. Maybe we can put that on the disadvantage portion. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we have to. <laughs> if we have to. <laughs> um, next question is, if I understood correctly, ERDAP is not a repository itself. If that is so, how will an update in metadata be communicated to the data repository in which the data is actually stored? So that's a great question. Um, yes, it is not a repository. And so any updates that happen within ERDAP will be available through that ERDAP service. So there would typically be have to be a communication process with the repository saying that this is up to date. Now that can be set up as a machine to machine service. Uh, within ERDAPs that are federated, it's possible to set up a subscription service so that when you know so that you'll know when something at the original host changes that it will that it needs to be updated at the um, the federated host. So there's nothing specifically in ERDAP that will say, hey, uh, you know, archive, I've updated this metadata, come harvest me. But there are ways to set up communications with that amongst ERDAPs for sure. Great, thanks. Oh, wow. There's a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Um, <laughs> how easy is it to configure ERDAP to use some something like, for example, MySQL? ERDAP will connect to databases as well. Um, we have one instance where we are connecting it to an Oracle database. So it really, the only thing you need is the, the Java database, the JDBC Java database connector for that particular instance of a database. Uh, and, and the only restriction on databases is that the table you're connecting to, you, well, you only can connect to a flat table in a database. So that table, that database table has to be flattened out. It will not connect to things that have lots of joins to other tables. Okay. 
Um, the next question is on training opportunities um, and specifically online training available for setting up AirDrop and using it as a client or user. That's a great question and that's one one disadvantage. Let's put that in the disadvantage because there's not a lot of that right now and I think um, this webinar is a first step in doing that and and sort of some of the little you know video 10 or three minute even little videos that I put together um, can provide a template for where we want to go and I, I hope getting some feedback through the people that are watching and listening to this webinar we can identify some really uh, important and frequently asked questions that we can then develop uh, some um, some tools to train tools for. And I'll say that within the Erdev community, there's a lot of people like me that are passionate about it and people uh, like Connor Delaney has put together uh, a nice tutorial of getting using Erdev uh, several years ago that's still, still valid. The guys at the Marine Institute really do a lot of outreach with that as well. So uh, it's a passionate community and I think if we know the questions people want to learn more about, we can develop some training tools. And, and I would love to look at something through the, the Ocean Teacher Academy to potentially provide some kind of online um, um, tool of training, whether it's a meeting or just a series of videos that answer particular questions, I think will be very useful. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is um, kind of twofold. Um, could video monitoring images be ingested in ERDAP and how is versioning and different processing levels managed by ERDAP? So there are, um, it does it does handle video files. Uh, I'm not too familiar with that because I'm not involved with video files, but I know you can uh, ingest video and audio files into ERDAP as well. So that does support those. Uh, in terms of versioning, um, there is no real versioning when you ingest data in the ERDAP as a, you know, a data set configuration. Now, I will say the new, ingest what I mentioned at the very end there where you can push data directly in the ERDAP, that does come with versioning assistance. So anytime you push new data into an ERDAP, it will create a version. So that in that sense, there's versioning control. But for data sets that just get loaded in, you know, uh, from the files that you created configuration for, there is no necessary any kind of versioning. That would have to be sort of done manually. Okay. Um, the next question uh, um, is having participated in several Otis Ocean Info Hub meetings, what do you think the optimal relationship on a global scale between these systems will be? Well, so that's a, that's a great question because that's, you know, I, I think about that a lot as I'm trying to put together this data strategy for the observation coordination group where we have these, you know, these global networks. And, and, and my goal would be for the global networks to utilize these ERDAP services have complete metadata that's required for things like Ocean Info Hub, as well as WMO, um, um, the WIS, the WMO Information Service, so that the Info Hub could build harvesting mechanisms to harvest from one single ERDAP that would be federated for all the other uh, global network ERDAPs. And that way, Otis Info Hub would only have to harvest from one one ERDAP service to get the information they need. And that's, that's where I, I think it would fit in. And, and the benefits to that are that then we don't pass these burdens, these data metadata call burdens down to people that are in the networks, people that are collecting the data and the scientists dealing with the data. It's can, it can be dealt with through the, the services and ensuring that the complete metadata exists in those services. Thank you. Um, there, I know you answered a partial question on different uh, data formats, but there's a, another one asking specifically for whether you can work in biodiversity data and I think there was another one a little further down um, are there any examples of using ERDAP for delivery of imagery or passive acoustic data yes so again the uh, I I believe that there are examples of using ERDAP for the acoustic data I have not done that yet we actually have we are looking to do that though because we have some ADCP data that are coming up with sail drones that we're starting to, to work with so yes I believe that the answer is yes to that although I don't have experience with that uh, in terms of bioeco data, ERDAP was actually originally developed for for biology, and so there's no issues with using bioeco data, you know, in in ERDAP at all. I think some of the issues that we we might have are what sort of standards are out there for that kind of data, so we know what to standardize against. But um, and, and you know, we it's becoming um, bio data is becoming more and more important, or 
protection. So it's becoming more important, but it's it's taking a, a even in even in OCG we're talking more about it. So there um, we do have to solve some of these issues. I anticipate that there are no issues in using that data with ERDAP, but again, I don't have any experience with that. Great. Um, from the goose angle, is there an ERDAP plan for handling EOV data along some sort of goose standards? Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, once the first step, I think, is if we can get the data again from the global networks that I, we're working with, and, and this would go with you know, the GUS regional alliances as well. But if we can get the data into into an ERD app, then we'll have a uniform way to access and use the data, which will mean there'll be lots, lots easier to per, to to create these sort of EOV synthesis files that are focused on individual variables. Uh, it'll make the process much more straightforward than having to go out to tons and you know dozens and hundreds of different sources with Different formats and access services to make that to make that done, make that product. I, I just think having ERDAP and, and and the uniformity of what ERDAP provides will make us much more uh, put us in a much better position to create EOV data sets like that. Uh, thank you. Um, the next question is on uh, which is the country with the highest ERDAP number of users. Oh. That's a great question. I, I don't know that question. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I think we talked about that earlier, but didn't have an answer to it either. Um, what is ERDAP's interoperability philosophy? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I mean, the interoperability, it, we're, ERDAP is based using the the um, on RESTful URIs, right? So that's that's basically how we're saying we're we're supporting machine services by by uh, making these RESTful APIs available, which you can then download the data or the metadata uh, in in ISO or schema.org. So you know we want to support standards um, that can be extended to improve this interoperability. And and certainly it's it's a little bit um, well. I should say that the OCG data strategy and the way we're using ERDAP is sort of biased towards the climate and forecast metadata conventions because many of the um, observing networks are embracing the net CDF uh, data format. Uh, and for those that aren't, we're looking to use ERDAP to have help them help embrace them. So, so I'd say with interoperability, you know, we're looking at embracing and and um, the standards that the community is using, uh, as well as other communities to ensure. Um, that we can interoperate between the communities. Great. Um, the next question is on, does ERDAP enable data discovery? And are there also ways to solve these kind of queries machine to, sh uh, to machine? It does enable data discovery. Um, and it does that again by the machine to machine services that will provide, you know, on request uh, an ISO 19115 document uh, that is conformant to ISO 19115. And then again, the schema.org, I, I can't emphasize that enough as, as this metadata, as this format, the structured metadata format that is being used by the people that know how to do discovery systems, and that's Google. I mean, discovery is a really hard problem. And I know within NOAA and within the US, we've been trying to conquer it for a long time and really haven't, but there is one company that has. And so using something that Google recommends to do to, to provide discovery is, is, I think, is very beneficial. And that's not to say that Google is the is where we want to go, but this is this is a schema.org standard that we support. And there's there's work being done by folks at the Marine Institute, like Adam Ledbetter and, and Rob Thomas, to develop sort of schema.org um, profiles for ocean data. And once those have been developed and are are uh, sort of a standard, let's say, we can then make sure that those get into ERDAP and, and ERDAP supports providing schema.org metadata in those profiles. Great. Um, the next question is, on uh, as a server-side system, should you devote a system to ERDAP? Are the loads on the system large? Uh, you know, the loads depend on, of course, how much data is being asked to, to do as, as a service. Um, and, um, you know, you know what the density of the data is. Um, we have not had issues with that. We, uh, speaking just from our experience, from my experience, we have several ERDAP servers running on one machine, uh, and we've never really come across issues with that. There are limits within each ERDAP that you can set in terms of memory limits, and if something exceeds those limits, it will get it will 
it will return an error message saying you've asked for too much information. Um, and I'll just note on when you federate ERDAPs, ERDAP does pass the processing load to the federated ERDAP rather than having the one global ERDAP absorb all that load. So it federates SMART in that in that way. Great, thank you. Um, we're coming up on top of the hour, but we have a couple more questions. So I'm gonna bombard you with a couple more. Um, sure. Um, you mentioned uh, APIs. Can you confirm that APIs can use ERDAP to access data rather than, say, MATLAB or Python? Uh, hence, users with no coding experience can use the API and access the data. Yeah, some of that you dropped out of some of that question, but yeah, the API is um, very straightforward. It's it's it is um, you know well I showed it I showed a, a, a very brief example, but you can clearly see you know the if if you did it longer where you did some more constraints like latitude and longitude, you can see where latitude is greater than or equal to. So it's it's quite straightforward to um, work with the API to develop queries uh, that you want. Uh, whether someone with no code could easily do it by going to the ERDAP server, and it, it can help you sort of develop that that um, RESTful query, you know, through the clicking of buttons. I want this, and I want this range, and now generate that URL, and you can see that URL, and it's very obvious in that URL what things you would want to change in order to modify the products that you receive. So. Great, thank you. Um, how can you incorporate standard vocabularies? So that um, you know, we we that is done. For example, I showed you uh, the CF uh, CF conventions and using the standard names. You can incorporate standard vocabularies just by using whatever those standard vocabularies are. So uh, when in the metadata attributes, there's no um, there's no restriction on how you can develop and uh, and put a metadata attribute in an ERDAP data set. So if there's a particular way that you want to do it for Darwin Core or something, I, I think you can do that. Uh, my experience is with CF, and that's and that's what we use in, in the ERDAP configurations. But there's no restrictions on how you um, how you create a, a metadata attribute within ERDAP. Great, thank you. Um, do you have an example of where sensors speak directly to ERDAP? Uh, I don't have one right now. I actually, I have developed that, but it was a fake sensor. I was just uh, using random data to push it into ERDAP just because I wanted to see how it worked. But um, there is some work uh, where I work at, at Pacific Marine Environmental Lab to actually implement something like that where, where we get data from a sensor. That data goes through, let's say, a Lambda service in the cloud, which does some configuration. Maybe it does some quality control and then pushes the result back into an ERDAP service. So. Uh, we are working on that, but I don't have uh, an example of that yet. And I don't know if there are other examples. There's a thing about the ERDAP community, it's incredibly diverse. And, mm -hmm. I, and I can say that I've been, as I said, I've been using it for 10 years and I still learn new things every time I, you know, I read the documentation or a new version comes out. So. Well, we are saving the chat. So in case we yep. do find out, we can always follow up. Um, the next question and probably the last one. <laughs> That I'll read for today. Um, it's a pretty big one. Uh, how do you envision the use of ERDAP in the UN Decade Digital Ocean Ecosystem? Well, I, I mean, I see, I see ERDAP as a way, and I hope I've got this point across. I just see ERDAP as a way to really improve interoperability of the data, which I think is a key aspect of the UN Decade for the Ocean, and using the data and ensuring that we understand the volume and we reach maximum value of the data that we spend so much time collecting and processing um i, I mean I, I just as 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 erdap allows us to move closer to these fair data principles which again are just really a beginning for improving interoperability but they're a great step i see erdap as a, a really useful tool that's relatively easy to use easy to understand easy to maintain that will really help you make these data processes more uniform and therefore contribute to the interoperability that is so crucial for the UN decade. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I think that was a good uh, question to end with. Um, just as a quick reminder, we dropped the uh, link in the chat box um, where you can find this event and where we'll post the recording. Um, please make sure to fill out either the survey 
um, or send us an email if you have any suggestions for any future webinars that you would like to see. Um, again, the two webinars that we're currently planning are one on ocean ops tools and ocean best practices, and we'll keep you, um, we're sending the survey to your email you supplied um, when you registered for the event. Sorry, the question just came in. Um, and with that, I think we're we're ready and I'm gonna make sure to collect all the questions so all the unanswered questions uh, can still be followed up on. Thank you so much, Kevin. This Thanks, is a everybody. Great Thanks, Anne.